Everyone, including you, will make mistakes in the garden. Gardening is literally learned by making mistakes just like this one right here. Today, I'm gonna to show you some of these mistakes so you kinda of get a head start in the garden. Let's get right into the nine beginner gardening mistakes that you wanna avoid. Mistake number one is starting too big or complex. It's so easy to get excited about gardening and get ahead of yourself before realizing how much work a garden really is. Large gardens can be completely overwhelming and when you grow a large variety of plants, it can be really discouraging when they don't all pan out for you. Start with a small area for your first season. If you're planting in the ground, maybe 10 by 10 feet, maybe 10 by 15 feet, don't go too big. A really good size for a raised bed is gonna be eight feet by four feet, those are really easy to build. And if you start with one or two of those, that's really manageable. For an example, here's my friend's garden. She has two eight by four beds, and as you can see, they're both completely overgrown with all kinds of different food. She has to come out here every single day and harvest and maintain, and even then, it still kind of gets away from her. For a beginning gardener, this, this is a lot to deal with. You don't know when things are ready to harvest, you don't know how to prune everything, and it's all kind of new to you. So my advice, start small for your first season. Mistake number two is planting the wrong things. There's an entire world of plants to grow and it can be pretty exciting to start learning about them all and just wanting to grow everything. That's what I did. But there's two things to consider when thinking about what you should be growing in your first or second year of gardening. The first thing is what grows well in your hardiness zone. If you don't know what hardiness zone you're in, I'm gonna leave a link down in the description below for the USDA hardiness map. So go click on that link, it will take you to a website. You can put in your address and you can find out exactly what zone you're in. Once you know what zone you're in, start doing your research on what's gonna be growing best in that zone. The second thing you wanna do is take a hard look at the list of plants that grow well in your zone and ask yourself, what are you actually going to eat? This is very important because I made this mistake with these cabbages right here. I honestly couldn't tell you why I grew these cabbages because I'm definitely not gonna be eating these, but luckily I know someone who will. Not everybody has a bunch of pigs and goats and chickens that can eat the food that they're not going to be. There you guys go, come on, here, let's put it in your bowl. Come on. You see, anything that we're not gonna eat ourselves, we can give to these guys right here. And the good thing about that is we take their manure and we compost it to use in the garden again. So it's just one big cycle of feeding them and then what comes out of them feeds our plants, which then feed us. But not everyone is this lucky. If you're growing something only because it's easy in your zone, you're gonna be pretty disappointed when you put all this time and energy into growing something, and then when it's time to harvest it, what do you do with it? You throw it in the compost pile, throw it in the garbage, try to find some friends to give it to, find things that grow well in your zone and you enjoy eating, like these tomatoes here. Mistake number three is accessibility to water. Place your garden as close as you can to your water source. I've made this mistake in the past and it really does put a damper on your season. If water isn't close to your garden, then that means you have to work to bring the water to your garden. And if it's work to water your garden, you're gonna find yourself not watering your garden. Nobody wants to be dragging a hose or buckets across the yard to water their garden. For us, our water is relatively close to our garden. We brought it over and hooked up some drip lines and it's all automated now. I don't have to do any work to water the garden. It's on a timer, I don't have to worry about it. You don't necessarily need to go that far, but if at all possible, Put your garden close to your water source. Number four is not taking notes. It's pretty easy to get lost in your garden season. You get so caught up weeding your garden and harvesting your garden that you forget to realize all of your successes and failures. When I step into my garden here, I'm observing. I'm walking around, I'm looking at the size of my plants, I'm looking at the spacing of my plants, I'm looking at what plants are healthy and what plants are unhealthy. I'm looking at where the sun is hitting on my garden at any specific time during the day. I'm observing everything I possibly can that looks like it might be important to me. Every time I come out to the garden, I've got my phone and I'm taking notes. What this does is it gives you a reference point for next season. When you go to start planting your garden, you can look back at your notes and be like, oh, I can't do that again, that was a mistake. Or, hey, maybe a certain type of crop didn't do well last year, so maybe I shouldn't grow it this year. Or, hey, maybe this crop didn't do well, so this one's similar, let's try growing that one. There are so many different things that happen during a gardening season that it's kind of hard to remember it all. You forget about the stumbling over plants because your spacing was too small. You forget about all that stuff because the rest of everything was just so good. But these are all things that can help you next season. So I challenge you, when you go to your garden, take notes keep track of everything you possibly can so you can set yourself up for success next season. The best gardeners in the world are learning from successes and failures of their own. So speed up that process by documenting everything you possibly can. Hey, if you're getting value from this video, give it a big mistake-free garden thumbs up and then share it with all your friends. I really appreciate it. Number five is bug phobia. One of the first things you might hear about when you get into gardening is how scary bugs are, how they can decimate your entire garden, which technically is true but it's not as bad as you might think. Before heading to your local store and getting whatever pesticide you can possibly find and completely covering your garden with it, take a step back. Look at what's going on around you, take a breath, 
evaluate what's going on, and then move forward from there. You have an entire ecosystem of bugs living within your garden, and sometimes you just need to get on their level to see what's really going on. You have bugs that are eating your plants. You have bugs that are eating those bugs. You have flying bugs that are pollinating your plants. You have bugs that are living within your soil. You have bugs all over your garden, and 90% of those bugs are really good and beneficial bugs. When you douse your entire garden with a pesticide, a lot of the times you're killing not only the bad bugs, but the good bugs too you're completely decimating an ecosystem that's working for your garden. A lot of times, your garden's little ecosystem is gonna work itself out. For example, at the beginning of this season, I had an aphid problem. I had a bunch of plants that had aphids all over them, on the pepper plants, on the cabbages, just kind of all over the place. I took a step back, I waited a week or two, and I watched the number of those aphids dwindle. Eventually, I did have to spray my cabbage plant with some neem oil and dish soap, which is an organic pesticide, and I was able to target it onto that one specific plant. If you do have to spray your plants, use something like neem oil, dish soap, that is gonna be doing it organically and not harming the rest of the life in your garden. I'll put the neem oil that I use down in the description below. Mistake number six. I'm a pretty young guy, and until this year, I've never had an issue just getting down in the garden, working on the ground. This year, I spent two entire days planting the garden out, and my entire garden is in ground this season. I spent two days planting the garden out, and my back is still hurting from that, and that was like four months ago. For a lot of people, planting in ground might be the cheapest way to go, might be the easiest way to go, and honestly, might be the right way to go. For me, next year, I'm switching it up to raised beds, just for the accessibility aspect. I'm gonna bring the gardening level up a little bit higher, so I'm not bending over so much, so when I get in there and weed, and get in there and harvest, it's not as hard as it is right now, bending all over the ground. As well as adding raised beds into my garden, I'm gonna be widening out all of these walkways because right now, if you can see, I'm only halfway through my season and these plants are touching, all of these plants over here are touching. In the next month or two, I'm not gonna be able to walk through here at all. I'm gonna have to move plants out of the way just to get in there and harvest. A garden should be a peaceful place to be not a stressful one. I shouldn't have to exert more energy than I need to to be here, and I should enjoy being in here. And by the end of this season, I know it's gonna be just like last season. <laughs> my walkways were too small, but I wanted to cram as much as I possibly could in my space, and it was a mistake. Don't overcrowd your garden. Make sure you're going with all the guidelines that tell you what your spacing is. And honestly, with my peppers, I wanna go even more than that, because right now, the guidelines are, I think, 18 to 24 inches for a lot of my pepper plants, and I sat right at 18 for a lot of them. 18 inches is just simply not enough for me to be getting in there and working. Next year, I'm gonna make this much more comfortable and a much more peaceful place to be. On top of that, make your garden easy to get to. If it's a mile away from your house, do you really think you're gonna be spending the time to go there every single day to water, to harvest, to pull weeds, stuff like that? I don't think so. If it's 20 feet off your house, are you gonna be more likely to go to your garden every day? I think you might be. Obviously, every property is gonna be different, but keep these things in mind when you're planning out your garden. Mistake number seven is exposure to the sun. Everybody probably knows that you need some sun exposure in your garden. Most of the time, it's the more sun, the better. I know here in my garden, we have a south-facing garden, which is really great for sun exposure. But what we also have is massive trees at the end of our yard that shade my whole yard during the end of the day. What we have on the other side is we have our house. So in the east, where the sun is rising, it comes up over my house and it shades the whole left side of my garden for the first few hours of sunlight. During the evening, I've got the trees over here towards the west side, and they're gonna be shading the other half of the garden all throughout the evening. So the only place that I really have any really good full sun exposure is dead center in the middle of my garden. Now, when I'm planning my season, I understand that. I know that if I need something that's super sun loving, I need it in the middle. Everything else can kind of go on the outskirts where it's getting a little bit less sun. This is another one of those things to think about when you're thinking about where to place your garden. I know that I've talked about that you want to be putting it close to a water source, but you can move a water source to your garden if needed. You can run a line out to your garden to where you have water access right in your garden, but you can't move the sun. You can't be changing the sun. So I would say the first thing to think about when you're looking at where to put your garden is the sun exposure. If I was to put a garden at the north side of my house, I get probably zero sun over there. I don't think I get any sun on that side of my house. Now, like I said, every property is gonna be different. Every house is gonna be different. Every backyard is gonna be different. If you have a yard that gets no sun, little to no sun, you can still garden. There are still things you can grow. A lot of them are gonna be kind of off limits to you, but you can still find things that are shade loving plants that you can still grow. Mistake number eight is not utilizing mulch. When you first get into gardening, you hear a lot about mulch, but you might not understand the importance of it. Mulch isn't just straw like this here. Mulch can also come in the form of, you know, dried leaves or, or wood chips or grass clippings. Mulch can come in a lot of different forms. 
but what mulch does is all pretty much the same. Before I put mulch down around this tree right here, I had to water this tree every single day because the sun was just beating down on it and evaporating all of that water. I put a nice thick layer of mulch around the base of this tree, and now I have to water this tree once every four or five days. Another really awesome thing that mulch does is it suppresses weeds. If you put a layer of mulch in your garden that's three, four, or five inches deep, weeds aren't really gonna be coming up through that. It's gonna be suffocating those weeds. So anywhere that I have mulch down, I'm not dealing with any weeds at all. A good organic mulch like this straw right here is also gonna eventually break down and feed your soil, which in turn is feeding your plants. When it rains or when you're watering from above and down onto the plant, a big thing that can happen without mulch is the water is gonna hit the soil and that soil is gonna splash up onto the trunk of your plant or the base of your plant or the leaves of your plant. Any, any kind of splashing of that soil onto your plants can cause a lot of bacterial issues, fungus issues. Mulch helps so much with that because it's not the soil that the rain is hitting. It's the mulch and nothing's gonna be splashing up. Mulch is definitely a must have in any garden. Last but certainly not least, number nine is not understanding soil. Understanding soil plays a very key role in gardening. With in-ground gardens, a lot of the times you can't just put your plants in the ground and expect them to live because sometimes your soil just won't allow for that. You have clay soils and with clay soils, when they're dry, they're rock hard. You can't, there's not really any working with them. And when they're wet, it's almost kind of like a sticky mud. If you put damp, wet clay soil in your hand and you squeeze it really hard, when you open up your hand, it's gonna hold its shape entirely. It's just gonna be this sticky mess of clay soil. Plants need oxygen in the soil to live. So with a clay soil, it doesn't give them oxygen because when it's wet, it's just sticky and gross and there, there's no oxygen in that soil whatsoever. And then when it's dry, it's just rock hard, the roots can't go anywhere and they're just suffocating. A lot of the times you can fix a clay soil by adding things like compost or rotted, rotted manure or leaves, just any kind of organic material that's gonna kind of loosen that soil up a little bit. Now there's also sandy soil, which is the exact opposite. If you have damp or wet sandy soil and you squeeze it in your hand really hard, as soon as you let your hand go, that soil is just gonna crumble up and, and fall apart. When it's dry, it's just gonna fall through your hands like sand at the beach. Maybe not quite dr so drastic, but it's gonna be the same idea. And with sandy soil, fixing that is a lot like fixing clay soil. You're adding organic material like rotted manure, compost, leaves, stuff, grass clipping, stuff you find in the yard. You need to build that soil and give it some structure and some nutrients. What you're looking for is a mixture in between the two. When your soil is wet, you wanna be able to squeeze it as hard as you can, open your hand, and you want that soil to hold its shape but then when you start poking at it, you want that to be able to fall apart. You don't want it to get stuck together. Now, a lot of the times a healthy soil is gonna be darker than your normal dirt that you see on the ground. It's gonna be a dark, rich color, and before you know it, you'll be able to spot it a mile away. Now, there are other issues with soil. Sometimes your soil won't have the right nutrients in it. Sometimes it'll be the wrong pH. What you can do is you can go to your local nursery and get a soil testing kit, and that'll tell you what kind of nutrients you're lacking within your soil. You can also actually send your soil into a lab to be tested. I don't necessarily recommend that because because that's kind of a lot of money and for your average, you know, at home gardener, that's not something you really need to do. Here's a little something I probably shouldn't admit, but I've never tested my soil. I've never needed to. Everything's always grown really well. I amend it every year and I just kind of keep going. If I ever come across a time where I, I'm not being able to grow what I want to grow, I'll get my soil tested and I'll add whatever I need to add. Every once in a while, you're gonna make a decision in your garden that is just so good that you implement it every single year. For me, it's in this video right here, and it's actually a fertilizer injector that injects fertilizer into my drip system. This is probably the best garden investment I've ever made. It was a little bit of money up front, but then in the long run, my garden fertilizes itself. Head over and watch that video and I'll see you there.